It's going to be a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Laura Renzi um, to give a lecture on vitrification laboratory aspects. So please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the organizer of the meeting. It's really a great honor for me to be here and share with you our experience and the literature about vitrification. I am an embryologist, so I will bring you in the lab. I know that the audience I am mainly of gynecologists, but I think that it's important from both sides to know what is happening new in the lab. So, um, first I will go a little bit through the history of cryopreservation in art, especially about vitrification, the principle of this approach, the potential risk related to vitrification, and then we are going to go through the outcomes, the laboratory and clinical outcomes, and see which are the present and the future application of this technique. I think that it's really a great responsibility of the lab to have an efficient cryopreservation program. It's really an essential part of assisted reproductive technology. It's not only a small part, but it's really very important if we think about the safety of the, the techniques and if we think about the best treatment for the patients. In fact, if we have a very good cryopreservation program, there will be no problem to lower the number of embryos to be transferred because then the pregnancy rate will be calculated cumulatively, which means that we can lower the risk of multiple pregnancy. Uh, we can allow the delay of the transfer in the natural cycle if the endometrium preparation is, let's say, not, not optimal. And uh, we can have other applications such as preservation of male and female fertility. Uh, it is calculated that cryopreservation contributes to the total delivery rate of about 30%, but I think that with a systematic application of cryopreservation, by lowering the number of embryos that are used in the fresh cycle, I think that this percentage can really be much higher than 30%. However, it is more difficult to, de to destroy a prejudice than an atom, what was said many years ago, and I think it's really true when we think about vitrification. Because the first technique applied in IVF for, to cryopreserved embryos was low freezing. And it was in the early 80s. And nothing changed for many, many years. And embryologists don't like normally to change protocols in the lab. Uh, however, vitrification was already there in animal models and entering the IVF in the late 90s, but it took many years before it was really applied in IVF laboratory. And I'm still here to convince you that vitrification is really an efficient approach 20 years later. What is vitrification? Vitrification is a pseudo-second order phase transition converting material into glass instead of uh, crystals. I just want to point about what is the probability to obtain vitrification. This probability is related to cooling and warming rates, to the viscosity of the sample, which means the cryoprotectant concentration, and the volume of the sample. I want to show you this, even if it's a technical approach, because it is really very important when you want to obtain an efficient vitrification program. And as you, you, you may know, vitrification can be performed with direct contact with nitrogen. I will go through this point later on in the presentation, but it's not because we are crazy and we want to put our cell in direct contact with a potential infected liquid, but because we want to optimize the technical aspect of vitrification which means the cooling and the warming rates. And we want to optimize another technical aspect of a vitrification, which is the volume of the sample. But we don't want to touch the cryoprotectant concentration, which is something that has a biological meaning, which, is, which can, can, can be harmful for the cells. So this is why the aim of the protocol are to optimize the technical aspect to be able to reduce the cryoprotectant concentrations. So how is it possible to go directly to glass phase without the formation of uh, uh, ice? Uh, when you higher the cryoprotectant concentration, you lower the equilibrium and freezing curve. And by hiring the cooling rate and the warming rate, you will higher the glass transition curve. As you can see, ice phase transition in an efficient vitrification is completely avoided. And of course, this is important for the cell because we know that the major cryo injuries related to cryopreservation are due to ice crystal formation inside 
our cells, the embryos. Different protocol has been suggested to perform vitrification, and mainly there are a combination of fatty and glycol, DMSO, and sucrose, and different carriers has been proposed in the literature, a lot of different carriers. Which is the best one? I don't know. I will show you what is best now in the literature, but I think that any lab can adjust its own protocol as long as they have an efficient vitrification. So mainly the carriers can be open, which means, again, direct contact with liquid nitrogen, or closed. And what the advantage of the open system is that you can reduce a lot the volume around your cell, which is called the minimum volume open system vitrification, because the carrier is open, so you can aspirate the medium around your cell, in this case, an outside. And, and as you can see, there is really very, a very small film around the cell. The volume is really very, very low. And then when you put this carrier in direct contact with nitrogen, of course the cooling rate will be very, very, very fast. And this is an optimum vitrification pro protocol. Um, vitrification can be obtained with different devices, but of course the cooling and the roaming rate will depend on the type of devices that you use. And closed system will never be able to obtain the same cooling rate as an open system. But we don't want to be only efficient. We surely want to be very safe for ourselves, no doubt. But is it impossible to make an open system vitrification in a safe way? Why are we more severe than the law? The law says that we should never put our cell in contact with potentially dangerous liquid. But the nitrogen can be today sterilized. By using sterilized nitrogen, we avoid completely the potential risk of cross-contamination. And of course, for storage, we should use a closed system, but this can be a second step. So everything is there in the literature to perform a safe, open system, as long as you really need it. And perhaps for embryo and blastocysts, this technique is so efficient that you don't need to be completely optimized. For all sites, it may, be, it may be more difficult, and that's why the majority of the center use an open system, although there are some a recent report with efficient closed system also for all sides. So now it's time for questions. It will not be a biological question, it will be a very simple question. So do you think that we take your pad, they told me to say this, and I'm going to read the question. Do you think that vitrification has replaced the slow freezing approach? Yes. A, B, yes, but only for some stages of development. C, no. Vote now. Wow, 63% already thinks that vitrification has replaced low freezing. So I can stop my presentation now. Thank you very much, because you are quite convinced. 23% thinks that it's only for some stages of development, and only 14% still think that uh, slow freezing has a place in uh, cryopreservation in art. I was really surprised this morning to see a lot of slides saying that when you cannot do a first transfer, you should vitrify embryo. So already vitrify embryo instead of cryopreserving embryo is really part of our uh, normal language now. It would have been impossible, I don't know, three years ago. So let's think it's very still place for slow freezing. And as I told you, vitrification can be applied at all stage of development, which means at all size stage, at tupian stage, at embryo stage, and at blastocy stage. I will go through all these stages to try to see if there is any evidence that vitrification is more efficient than slow freezing, or perhaps there are other advantages of a vitrification approach. We have to keep in mind that uh, our, the embryos are completely different during the development, which means that, for instance, the stress tolerance is inversely related to the stage of development. A blastocyst is, is much less fragile than an oocyte. And in fact, vitrification has been first applied for the most stable structure, which is uh, the blastocyst. Not only for this, but also because the special structure 
three-dimensional structure of the blastocyst, which has a liquid inside, makes this cell also more difficult, this embryo more difficult to cryopreserve with slow freezing because, again, of the risk of ice crystal formation. Uh, I'll start with blastocyst because blastocyst has been, blastocyst culture has been, in my view, really a, a, a very important innovative approach in art, I would say, in the, li in the late 90s. Uh, because this was the first step going for the reduction of num the number of embryos to be transferred, going to help the, the single embryo transfer without, without having a great reduction in the pregnancy rate. So we could transfer less embryos with the same results because these embryos are highly selected and have uh, higher potential of implantation, higher potential of implantation. But when we transfer less embryo, we want to have a, a good cryopreservation protocol to be sure to have different attempts to offer to the patients. And uh, blastocyst um, vitrification, has, uh, vitrification has been introduced for blastocyst also because um, there are some technical aspects related to blastocyst stage. There are more cells, so they can better compensate for cryo injuries. The cells are smaller, they can better make the cryoprotectant enters in the cell. Uh, and if we look to the meta-analysis in the literature, it is quite clear that the survival rate is better when you apply for this cell stage vitrification. And if you look to the literature, uh, all the devices used to, cry up, to vitrify uh, blastocysts has been really very efficient in terms of survival, but also in terms of implantation and pregnancy rate. But we should always think that our results are not only related to the cryopreservation procedure itself, but also to the quality of the cell that we are cryopreserving. And in fact, the quality of the blastocysts is really very important. Uh, factor determining the competence of this cell. It is clear that if you vitrify a good quality blastocysts, they are going to survive better, they are going to implant better and give rise to a higher implantation uh, pregnancy rate. And this is clear for all stage of development. Of course, the quality of the cell that you are cryopreserving is indicating also the competence of this cell before cryopreservation and after cryopreservation. But as I said, the, the blastocyst stage has a very special structure, and there is this liquid inside the, the blastocyst. And many, many authors have suggested to remove this liquid with different kind of interventions. And when you make the blastocyst collapse, it seems that the survival is better. This is really my personal opinion, it's not evidence-based medicine, but I hate to make extra manipulation to our cells because when you take out the embryos from the, blastocyst, from the incubator, sorry, you always make a damage to this cell. So I would avoid any kind of intervention. And I have just a very small suggestion to give, which was also in some very recent paper, just anticipate the vitrification before there is a complete expansion of the blastocyst rather than uh, make this kind of intervention. But this is in the literature, and in fact, what is reported after this kind of intervention is very high, very high implantation rate and survival. I want to point out another very important aspect of blastocyst vitrification, of blastocyst square preservation in general, is that not all the blastocysts develop in the same moment. Some from the same patient, from the same court, you will have blastocysts on the morning of day five, on the afternoon of day five, on the morning of day, of day six, and why not also on day seven. And to apply slow freezing, which seems to be quite efficient uh, also for blastocysts, but it's really technically very difficult because slow freezing takes hours. And sometimes in, in the afternoon of day five, if a transfer is canceled because of any problem related to the patient, let's say a risk of hyperstimulation, I don't see many embryologists starting a slow freezing at six o'clock in the evening in the afternoon and waiting until 10 o'clock in the evening that the, the, the slow freezing finish. So, and repeated it perhaps the day after. So I want to point out that uh, vitrification really helps in this because you can really optimize the timing of cryopreservation because it takes only a few minutes per blastocyst. And maybe you can even rescue blastocysts, for instance, at day seven. 
So although um, slow freezing can be efficient for, for blast assist uh, cryopreservation, I think that vitrification offers one major advantage, which is the optimization of the timing of cryopreservation for each individual embryo. What about cleavage stage? For many years, we were very happy with our cryopreservation program at cleavage stage, which was the slow freezing protocol. But then Bazak Balaban, my friend, made a beautiful randomized controlled trial showing that vitrification was more efficient than slow freezing. When you look not only to the survival rate, which was already very good with slow freezing, but when you look to the 100% survival rate, which means that all the cells or the embryo it are survived, then vitrification seems to be really more efficient. And this is also our personal observation. So it's not only survival, but also to keep all the cell of the embryo, so to keep all the potentiality of the embryo. And in this beautiful study, the metabolism was also analyzed, and vitrification seems really to preserve better the metabolism of the embryos, and then also the implantation was very high and successful. Then we have some meta-analysis that normally look only to the survival rate, and they agree, most of the studies agree, that embryos and blastocysts, even combined, which is the truth of what happens in a normal lab. Sometimes you cryopreserve at embryo stage, sometimes you cryopreserve at blastocyst stage according to the day of transfer. You have to have a technique which works at any stage of development. Like this, you can choose the day of transfer only according to the policy of the gynecologist for that, determined, for that patient. So survival rate seems to be really more efficient than vitrification, and also the clinical data are very good. But the thing was quite performing well for embryos. What about all sites? Ah, for all sites, this was much a more difficult story because this beautiful cell is really very sensitive. It's a very special cell, completely different from, from all the other stage of development. First of all, it is not a developing cell. The embryos and the blastocysts can be cryopreserved at different timing because in the meantime that you prepare your cryopreservation, uh, they are going to grow in the, in the incubator without any problem. But that's not the same for the old side. The old side are arrested at metaphase two stage and they cannot stay like that. And if you keep them like that in the incubator for hours, they are going to get age and the quality and the unemployed rate of the deriving embryo will be increased. So you have to be very efficient and very fast when you're, you have an all-site prior preservation program. And you have to be able to do it for each patient individually. And also there are a lot of structure of the old side. I'm not going to go through all these structures. They are very sensitive to any kind of manipulation, especially the cryopreservation. But all site cryopreservation is really very important. Think about the incredible application of this technique. We were working as sister reproductive technology for 30 years without thinking about the possible application of all site cryopreservation, not only for fertility preservation, for, uh, um, in case of disease, for social freezing, in case of hyperstimulation risk, to avoid the production of a lot of embryos, many of which will stay in our tanks, and many other applications. So because we were obliged in Italy, because of a very severe law, we started to cryopreserve all sites. And the law was very bad, but at least made one thing good, to improve our knowledge and our capacity to cryopreserve all sites. And I had the chance to collaborate with um, some other group, especially with the EV group that was already vitrifying all sites. And we started to introduce vitrification. We tried try to do it really to validate the technique in a scientific way which means with randomized controlled trial, with um, meta-analysis, I will show you everything that we did to try to validate the technique. And I hope we succeed. So randomized controlled trials have been performed in EV on egg donation program and in our center with the infertile population, which means any kind of oocyte from any patient age group. And then we look to the clinical results also. So first I want to show you this uh, systematic review of randomized controlled trials and the meta-analysis. If we think about the pyramid this morning of evidence-based medicine, this is at the top of the pyramid. 
random, um, systematic review of randomized controlled trial. So we can say that uh, vitrification, according to these studies, that uh, vitrification is more efficient than slow freezing with, when you look to the survival rate of human oil size, and uh, when you look to the fertilization rate, it seems similar to what you can obtain with fresh oil size. These are the two messages. Okay, but fertilization and survival is really not enough. What we want is baby. It's for sure the, the final outcome has to be the take-home baby, no doubt. So we were able only to, to make a longitudinal cohort study to look what was the results, uh, how many babies in a very restrictive condition when very few oocytes could be inseminated in fresh. So we performed a lot of warming cycles with the oocytes in our severe law. And when we rea uh, what we realized is that oocyte vitrification give us a, an incredible contribution to the cumulative pregnancy rate, but especially for the young population of women. So for the good quality all sites, 43.2% delivery rate per warming cycle, which is really, I think, very efficient. 43% uh, delivery rate per warming cycle. Let's look to another model, which is the, don the egg donation model. Again, perfect all side coming from donors. This is a beautiful randomized control trial, double-blinded study performed in Ivy Valencia, Bayana, Cobo, and, and the group. 600 couples involved, 600 uh, recipients involved in both groups, fresh transfer and vitrify, all side vitrified transfers. Uh, so, very high number very powerful study, same fertilization rate, same embryo quality, and delivery rate of 43% in the fresh and the vitrified group, which is really exactly the same that we obtain in our young population of patients. So really incredibly high. What do you expect for a fresh transfer? It is even more than what we were expecting from a cryopreservation program. So just to convince you again and again, we did a multi-centric longitudinal study, so we tried to put together the experience of three different centers, two in Italy and one in Spain, again with Ivi Valencia and with Clinica Mangiagalli in Milan. And this was to put together the numbers in only in the infertile population, all age groups. We were able to involve 486 cycles, 2,721 all sites warmed, uh, 2,300 2, survived all sites. We transferred 436 embryo and we obtained 147 newborns, which means that 5.4% of the all sites warmed give rise to a baby. It's about 17 all sites. I made the calculation before. Very similar to what we, uh, what we have seen before. But I don't think that the calculation is really correct in this way because each all site is not an independent entity. You all agree that the all sites coming from the same court are linked to each other. I would say 10 all sites from a 44 years old woman will behave more or less all in the same way as compared to all sites coming from a 32 years old woman. So we cannot calculate it per all site. It would be true if each all site would be completely independent from the woman that has produced it. So we made an, a, a different kind of calculation. We made what is called a partitioning, partitioning analysis, which is a statistical analysis. And according to the significance, the computer tells you which are the cutoff. And in fact, the cutoff is eight, more than eight mature all sites. So when you have more than eight mature all sites in a single uh, ovarian stimulation, in a single pickup, the delivery rate is about 46% as compared to 22%. Is it because there is eight oral sites, more than eight, or it is because these are good responder patients? That's the point. It is because of intrinsic quality of a good quality of oral site or because you need all these numbers? I don't know. But it is for sure that a good responder patient that has eight oral sites has probably better oral sites and more oral sites to be used. To, to be warmed and then uh, inseminated. And also the quality of the embryo is important. In fact, uh, 
uh, in this good population of patients, when good quality embryos were obtained on day three and thus the transfer was postponed to day five, the delivery rate was as high as 62%. If I'm correct. Yes, because I cannot read that. What about the age? In the population of patients where less than eight or side or equal of eight or side were obtained, the age was a very important factor. And in the young population of patients, we still had 27% delivery rate per patient, while in the older population, it's only 12. So what we discover is that with all, vitrified all sites, number of all sites, age and quality of embryo are the parameter will determine the delivery rate, which is exactly what we expect for fresh all sites. So not really a discovery, but it is important to know when you do counseling to the patient, I think, to know more or less which is the probability according to these three factors. Okay, I said that our uh, primary outcome measure has to be the delivery rate, but I think it's really not enough, not for vitrification, but in art in general. We should think that uh, we should be safe and we, we should have healthy babies, not only deliveries. And there are many aspects that we don't, still don't know related to art and related to any kind of new approaches such as vitrification, which may be related to metabolomic, transcriptomic, proteomic, but also epigenomic. But this is true for art in general, and we shouldn't look only to vitrification, only to one technique, but we should look to the whole procedure. And this has not been clarified for art in general. I don't know how we can expect to be clarified only for vitrification. So it will be our next step to, to really to try to see if there are any potential long-term risk on our embryos. So um, when new techniques are introduced in the lab, it opens really new frontiers to, to our application. And, and female fertility preservation by all sides, prior preservation, has, is really a new application in our field. And I really think it's really very important to be implemented everywhere because it offers an incredible possibility to oncological patients, of course, but also for social thing and many other applications. And it's a way to compensate the biological inequity between male and females in the reproductive field. And it seems that with vitrification, when you introduce vitrification in your lab, you, you are not only able to uh, optimize one stage of, uh, of embryo cryopreservation, but all the stages with the same technique, which is also a very important advantage of vitrification. You don't have to adjust for the different uh, stage of development. You can use the same protocol, and you can be very fast and optimize the timing. And when we think about one, a technique that uh, is able to offer to you excellent survival, developmental ability, which is similar to a fresh one, uh, consistent results between different centers, and optimal timing for cryopreservation, this means that together we are doing the best for our patient and offering the best opportunity when we treat our patients, which is the goal of all of us, I think, in this audience. So the question is now, when? When would be the optimum moment to make vitrification? Would it be at metaphase 2 stage, at 2PN stage, at embryo stage, or at blastocyst stage? I think that uh, because the survival is very good, the implantation is of course related to the stage of development because more we are late in the stage of development, more the embryo is selected, and of course more competent is. But of course the number are different. It is true that a blastocyst has a higher potential as compared to the old site, but you have to think that from 10 old sites, you will obtain only three blastocysts. So at the end of the story, cumulatively, it will be probably the same. So it's just a philosophical approach. Would you prefer to cryopreserve before experimentary? Like this, you can make a fertility preservation to your patient, so it will be independent from the couple, it will be only for the women. Or you prefer to do it after, embryonic genome activation, to have a highly selected embryo, I think that if, when you have vitrification in your lab, you can adjust for each single patient because anyway, the total efficiency will be the same and you can really choose according to the day of transfer or the quality of the embryo. So take your... So I'm, it is exactly the same question of before, but I, I think that I've been so... <laughs> 
So uh, you, you are completely convinced that vitrification has replaced soil freezing. So A, it's yes. B, it's yes, but only some, for some stages of development. And C, it's no. It is an improvement. <laughs> it was 63, not 79, and for next meeting it will be 100%. I hope, and anyone who is interested in vitrification can send us the embryologists or come to, to visit our lab because I really think that uh, uh, improving this technique, it will improve in general uh, uh, the results for in art. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Laura.